Hello there. Um, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon and read you a story. The first one is called Causes by Lydia Nicholas. Corridors fall into the distance to the left and to the right of you. Smooth white floors curve into smooth white walls, curve into bright white ceilings and on broken strips of white light, dimmed in the mockery of the night. The strip-lit hall leaves no dark angles for any dirt to stick to or exhausted gaze to rest on. By about 4 a.m., your aching brain can't hold on any longer to the corridor shape. It splits into polygons of white greys and grey whites that spin and morph in bland repeating patterns like a middle manager's kaleidoscope. The pieces spin and come together in other forms, other corridors. Fighting nausea, you slump back in your smooth white chair. There's no grip or give in the white, clean white plastic ice cream scoop of a seat. Your bum shoots forward and the back of your skull slams against the rim of the backrest. Ow! Dig your heels in and push yourself back up before you're seen slumped like a fool. A great image this would be to get out. Nationalist and progressive extremists finally unite in common cause against the idiot woman left watching hospital halls for them who can't even use a chair. You could be a mem. You peer around for photographers, spy drones, anything. Nothing. Looking over your shoulder, through the soundproofed frosted glass wall, you see the blurred, incomprehensible bustling of white coats and medical equipment. Keeping an eye out. That's your job tonight. And it's a job rendered irrelevant by the security staff on every hospital entrance the scanners and beepers on every person and system throughout the palace complex. All the other comm staff will be on the net where they are actually useful, monitoring and manipulating rumours. Who did this? Why? Was it nationalist ter terrorists streaking for closed borders or quarantines? Raging against the prince's foreign wife? Was it progressives? demanding the opening of everything for all, never mind the cost and contagion. Our foreign agents, religious extremists, corporate interests, individual attention seekers? Who slipped a contagion past the palace quarantine? Comms will be playing the news wires like a string band. That is where you belong. You can't even get Twitter here but an heir to the throne. Even an unconscious one must have his attendance. This long night must surely be a hazing thing, a dull head pounding, a threshold to your new life. Maybe your new colleagues each have had their own nightmares of 24 hour stints spent in these corridors Hours left clueless about how serious this particular attack on His Highness's body might be. Hours spent wondering how many rounds of exhausting speculative treatments, how many hours or days of waiting, how much chopping and cauterizing the royal flesh will take before the crisis is passed. You remember another long wait in another long white corridor. For an instant, those crowds, the screaming children and the shouting, shoving cues, smear the white, clean halls with old terror. You hear the ghost of a quiet, ceaseless cough. Blink, breathe. There is only silence here. The first thing they do, once they've shown you the toilets and cafeteria and living quarters, 
which comes after the shaving and dousing and burning, which comes after the month-long quarantine with its endless swabs and petri dish smears, which comes after the interviews, the background searches, the Q&A sessions spent in EEGs and MRIs and fitted with GSR bands. The first thing they do once you reach your desk and it's all becoming actually really real is they hand you a fresh new phone that's already ringing. You answer. Hello? You say, pitched carefully for the mentor in front of you, any interested new cubicle mates. You use an accent your mother would have sneered at, a recognizable regional tint to the vowels to indicate pride and sincerity, consonants clear as crystal. Clear crystal to hint at years in the right schools. They can tell it's a cover, of course, of course, but perhaps they don't know you know they know. He answers, actually him, him, himself. Good afternoon and welcome to the palace. I trust the introduction process is passed without complication and your accommodation is satisfactory. You turn. You feel every molecule of breeze flowing over your freshly buzz-cut scalp. Yes, everything is great. No, that isn't right. You can't speak to the third in line to the throne in monosyllables. Exceptional. The accommodation is exceptional. I am, of course, most excited about these facilities which will permit me to use and develop my skills in order to meet the challenges of this new role. It ends soon. An invitation to the new starters tea on the lawns. The family will be there. The family. Him, her, them. A colleague lets you know that you can take out a loan against your first pay to purchase suitable attire. Attire? Wow! You've only ever owned clothes before. Them, though. Him. Her. The brilliant Indonesian human rights lawyer wife and the children whose mixed race features in about half the death threats you have had to sort and tag in the early rounds of the interviews. You think it would be strange to meet people in the flesh after you've read so many descriptions of the way they'll die. When you work, you feel like a surgeon, palpitating the swollen mass of social media's rage. With sensitive algorithms, you test and categorize the swelling and identify those postules just about to burst. You're there to trace the root cause of the trauma. This cluster of interconnections looks like private clinic profiteers are engineering a gro grassroots protest to the opening of a new hospital. That surge related to an outbreak of gastroenteritis in Liverpool. The family's howls of grief and rage echo each other a little too closely. So, triangulate the location of relatives' debts the threatener's addresses and social networks. Identify the locations the activists most likely use to hand out the pamphlets. Reconstruct elements of its likely contents. Recommend which camera feeds to pull. They'd been impressed with that one. Really impressed with that one. A thousand applicants for every opening here and you made it. You actually made it. Those first few days, you thrilled at the work, grappling with models and tools better than any you got to play with outside. Your cubicle neighbour made obscure jokes about structuring database queries, and you laughed, you really laughed, and no one glared or snarled for an explanation. 
You leant back from your second floor desk, sipping the best coffee of your life and watched through a real open window, feeling the unfiltered breeze as staff flowed past below you. Of course, there are patterns to see there too. The old guard press it close, valuing privacy, flaunting their confidence in the palace's clean system with touches and whispers. Your staff back away, unconsciously attempting to maintain the wider personal space they learn to acquire outside, the cough's distance enforced in all nurseries. Old and new staff, attempting conversations slide backwards in an unconscious comedy of mismatched manners. Lean in, step back, lean in, step back, and pirouette and tap. You sipped extraordinary espresso and watched the strange palace dance. You are the very newest of the staff here, but you are skilled at spotting and following subtle rules. You're used to mimicry, observing the flow from the outside. Little changeling, your mother calls you from childhood, for the dark hair and eyes would set you apart from your sisters. The name stuck, though the tone she used changed over the years. Blink. Someone is running up the right-hand corridor. You've been awake over 20 hours. And the white clean corridor is so fearless that for a long moment you have the horrendous sensation that the white-coated man with the suitcase handcuffed to his wrist is running on the spot and growing, bulging in spurts, filling your field of vision. This image is familiar. You think you know the message he is bringing and you don't want to hear it. You don't, you don't. But then you are standing up and I've got yourself together. ID. He rolls his eyes and fumbles. The ID card dances with fraud-resistant holograms. His hand is shaking as he holds it out to scan, exhausted. You smile. Any clues as to who's behind it? You think they tell me? Well, I haven't seen anyone or heard any news in hours. Come on, I'm, I'm comms tech. Radio silence is killing me. Where, what are they saying? The glass wall is slowly sliding back to reveal an airlock. He steps through as soon as the crack is wide enough. Official line, it still says he's exhausted. Outside, I don't know. There's a lot of noise. I, I'm not much of a news person. This is impossible for you to understand. As though the man had denied he breathed oxygen, he sees it in your face. So, there's a whole thing about it being an inside job. He's getting too political. The princess treading on too many important toes. The progs are acting outrage. The glass screen slides back into place. The silence is instant. You see a helpless, exaggerated shrug through the frosted glass. Inside job. Damn it. Comms must be on fire. The urge to swipe open your newsfeed is physically painful. The filters would run. Oh, the material you could scrape concerning the factions, accusations, categorised by place, affiliation. Those are publishable papers right there, and all of it slipping away while you sit here, helpless. You lean back in your seat, cautiously, and stare at the ceiling, lights until their white spots dance in your eyes. Blink. Breathe. You've had only a week to enjoy your new living quarters. A small single room. A bathroom with strict washing routine and symptom reporting regulations printed directly onto one smooth wall. On the other hand, there are those bright prints you chose, fabrics and rugs, and a window looking onto the complex's private park where the children play. If you do well, 
There are larger rooms, apartments, segments in other comms, teams, and other complexes. You will do well. A small set of trinkets is on your desk. The wobbly clay elephant your younger sister made for you when you first left the city to study. His four feet refuse to touch the ground together and it trembles at the slightest disturbance. Your movement, the buildings, the cities. Sometimes you hover your hand over it and feel it thrum with something like life. A mechanical clock from your mother. Its tick is a comfort. Its cautiously classic design, a reminder of the gulf across which the two of you try to connect. A fluffy bear from your older sister feels strange to the touch after its cavity search on the way through quarantine. And the last photo of you and your sisters as a tree together. Your mother smashed the frame of the copy you gave her when you said you were leaving. Why don't you think about anyone else? Why don't you think about what she's already lost? Your older sister fed her son in silence. You explained. What? That you really believed in the royal couple's campaigns for more and better hospitals, for better care, even in losing battles? That she wanted an end to these isolation wards, the cells stacked three high in long rooms they won't let you see, even if your family, even if you push past the doctors howling and get a glimpse of the endless honeycomb doors before the floor turns beneath you and you fall into security's hands. Your mother curled her lip at that idea, that you, of all people would accept as truth a story that made some sense of it all. A romantic story of a quiet prince courting a brilliant radical lawyer across a political carousel of fundraisers and awards and debates and on into the centre of these burning populist causes that you, of all people, had found a place for yourself in that story. Or did you explain that you were good at what you did? That you could do good with that story? Do good in that story, spin though it might be? Or did you just say that you're ambitious? What is wrong with being ambitious? Yes, you wanted more. What on earth is wrong with that? Don't come back, she said. I don't intend to, I said. Blink. Breathe. You stare at the ceiling. Nothing so complete as an idea emerges. Half-made theories, factions and motives and means go spinning through your mind. Mind. Pointless. You nephew. You'll send him something from the elegant palace complex shops when this is over. An educational toy your mother and sister won't deny him, even coming from you. Or you could set up an emergency medical fund for him. They can't object to that. Maybe they let him send you a note. The frosted glass, like walls, slide back. You jump to your feet. A woman pops out of the crack, like a cork from champagne, fleeing down the hall. Hey! She keeps running. You barely saw her face. Were those tears? Let her go. You see a man in the airlock. We buzzed head office. The details. They always want direct confirmation. You identified it? You know who did it? You've been thinking? Was it progs? Framing nationalists? They know there's enough sympathy for the family right now that any attack will come over as crude and, and they've got some skilled factions in the youth wing. I can see them going for that angle. He looks at you strangely. You've misread something. <gasps> Not a big player. Some lone nutter got slow acting spores on a gift for the five-year-old's birthday party. Awful, but they play well. 
You are so tired, you can't pass his silence. Just tell me why they... You don't understand. That doesn't matter. Of course it matters. The man explodes. You think you've had a job chasing conspiracies anymore, you idiot. Is dead. The world slips gently out of its orbit. A slip digit, a shift in weight. The taut equation that held it on course for so long degrades in a death spiral. Just a stub toe and staph cellulitis, and then sepsis. We can't even find the break in his skin. Under the nail, we think. If there is a break, we don't know. He looks around as if he can see what you can, that the corridor is flying apart and bright white shards falling into the sky, quieter, staring at his hands. He says, we don't know. Someone is sobbing. Something is broken. You wrench at the space, try to force it back into the right place, the right time. When you bring the pieces together, you find that it is you. Thank you.